but we tried to teach her to interact with the baby in such a way that she would elicit positive feedback from him, and so that they could be friends, and then we also taught her that she should take care of the baby, and that gave her something to do. So that worked. We also didn't let them tease each other. Not much. You know, they're going to tease each other a bit, because siblings often bloody or hate each other when they're, when they're young, and sometimes that just destroys the relationship for their whole life. It's like, you don't want that, because you're stuck with your damn brother till he dies, hopefully, or until you do. <laughs> so, anyway, so my daughter was taking care of this little guy, and, you know, she used to watch him on the steps and sort of shepherd him around, and she, she was pretty good at it. And then, um, one day, he started to walk, and she kept talking about her baby, and we told her that, well, he wasn't really a baby anymore. And we didn't realize that this was setting off a cognitive revolution of the Piagetian sort, because, of course, She'd kind of grown attached to this baby, just like mothers do. And mothers sometimes get so attached to their babies that they really don't want them to stop being babies. And so they end up living in their house till they're 55, you know, plotting the destruction of the world. So you don't want to have that happen. So, but it was happening in, in a microwave with her. It's like, well, there's this baby, and I spent a lot of time getting used to it and figuring out what to do with it. And now it's not a baby anymore. What, what the hell is it? So she had this amazing dream, and it ties back to the shamanic stuff that I taught you guys about earlier. So this is the dream. She dreamt that the baby crawled into a hole in the backyard. Now, the way the hole got there was that a tree from the park beside us had moved into our backyard, and then it had burned down and left this hole. And then the hole was full of water. And so the baby crawled into the water, and it reduced him to a skeleton, and then there was a bug in the water, and the bug pulled him out, and when he came out, he was a new creature. So it was, it was perfect. Like she came and told me that, I don't know, like two in the morning in her little three-year-old voice saying I got it all typed down. It was absolutely spectacular because it was a straight shamanic dream. Like the tree burned down and so that's a transformation motif and then water is the place of rebirth and you know the kid was dissolved into a skeleton and the little bug that pulled him out is like a representation of the underlying process that guides transformation. And her little brain was like working like mad trying to figure out Continuity over change. That's a tough one, right? Because it's almost like a butterfly emerging from a cocoon. It's a big deal. Baby to toddler, that's a big difference. And, you know, she's supposed to figure out, well, that's the same thing. Well, no, it's not. So underneath her unconscious mind, you know, three-year-olds are not stupid, even though they can't talk. They've got this brain that's like 3.5 billion years old. It's not stupid. So... So anyways, um, now why was I telling you that? <laughs> oh, well, it's another indication of how... So, the transformations of cognitive structure are forced upon a child, at least in part by the development of increasing physical ability. Right? Because as you increase in physical ability and capacity, then the world transforms, and then your cognitive processes have to transform to keep up with that, and sometimes that's a radical transformation. So, Piaget's fundamental hypothesis is that part of the reason that people are motivated to undergo cognitive transformations and learning per se is because as they mature, they, re they automatically come into contact with anomalous information. Information that they cannot process from within the confines of their current world model. And because they can't process it, it interferes with them getting what they want. And so they're motivated to keep their cognitive structures updated. So, and sometimes the revolutions occur at a micro level, and that might be like when you're learning the difference between this and this. You know, it's like, it's a major difference, but it doesn't, you know, disrupt the whole fabric of your conceptual universe. Whereas a divorce might, the baby transforming into a toddler might, puberty does. It's because like you just finally got used to your body, you're 12 years old, eh? So you're sort of at the pinnacle of childhood, you're like an adult child. You know what you're doing. And 11 and 12 year olds are often lovely creatures because they're pretty mature and they've got their act together. And then all of a sudden, bang, sex hormones kick in. It's like, you are no longer the same thing. And neither is anyone you interact with. And so it's like turbulence for 3, 4, 5, 20, 30 years until you sort of sort that out, which you never really do. And so you can see how the physiological transformations that are attendant on development, some biologically predicated and some an emergent consequence of learning, disrupt the cognitive structures that people use to orient themselves in the world, and that some of those disruptions are sort of low-key, 
equivalent to normal science, and that would be assimilation, and some of them much broader, and that's equivalent to accommodation. Assimilation means you learn something new that you can already handle using the constructs that, and schemas that you have at hand. You know, so maybe you have to pick the thing up like this, instead of like this, but you already know this and you know that, so who cares? It's like a little minor alteration. And sometimes, well, no, you have to readapt your whole body in order to handle the next level of complex problem solving. Learning to drive is like that, learning to ride a bicycle is like that. And you can see that there's sort of a... There's not really normal versus revolutionary transformations. There's sort of a continuum that, it, that map themselves onto that hierarchy I showed you. You know, so if at the very highest levels of resolution, it's minor transformations, and up the higher levels of abstraction, you can blow out whole huge chunks of yourself. So it's a continuum. But Piaget and Kuhn sort of conceptualized it as a dichotomy. All right. <clears throat>